cause me to react and I see this type of stuff day in and day out. So I can only imagine the powerful and excruciating impact it can have on your emotions when you see some of the things that you have seen so far in this trial and will see as this trial progresses. But it is absolutely imperative that this trial proceed with as little exhibition of emotion as humanly possible because emotions cannot be the basis for making decisions. Emotions never based on, I mean decisions based on emotion usually are not very good. And I can't allow this jury to be influenced by the emotions that get expressed. Again, I cannot imagine what you're going through and how difficult it must be to withhold emotions, but I must ask you to do so respectfully. If it's going to be difficult for you to do that, I ask you, particularly if it's someone with your family, I ask you to step outside. I think, do y'all have TVs in your office? That you can go, you can watch it downstairs and express any you know, emotions that you may have at that time without it uh, falling on the shoulders of the jury. Their job is difficult enough as it is. And uh, I just uh, have to be very careful not to allow that. I hope you understand the position I'm taking. I certainly understand uh, what you must be going through. Uh, and have no problem with it whatsoever, except for when it's in the presence of the jury. I would, would not expect it. I respectfully ask you to do your best uh, to maintain yourself. And if you don't think you can do that, particularly if it's someone, you know, your son or daughter, or whatever the case may be, to watch it from the TV down in the uh, District Attorney General's office on the fourth floor, at least until that testimony is over. Okay. Uh, and thank you again. Anything else on that? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. We ready to bring Jerry back in? Who is your next witness? Next witness is Chantilla Wagner. Get the jury on again. Yes, sir. Put it on and on.
Mark Sig mentioned you raise your right hand. Sure. Good afternoon, Ms. Wagner. Would you please state your name and spell it for the record? Uh, Shantil Wagner, uh, S-H-A-N-T-I-A Wagner, W-A-G-G-O-N-E-R. Ms. Wagner, I saw that you were walking with crutches as you walked up to the witness stand. Have you always needed the assistance of crutches to walk? Yes. You Did you need them before April oh, of no. 2018? No. Okay. Um, and so why do you now need crutches to walk? Um, for the gunshot wound to my leg. Did, in April 2018, um, were you a resident of, of Nashville, Davidson County? Yes. Yes. Um, how long have you lived here? Um, probably since forever. Well, I moved to Antioch from East Nashville, okay. um, probably since 2011. And who was Aquila Da Silva to you? Uh, my boyfriend. How long had the two of you been dating? Uh, at the time, uh, on and off, like seven years. Okay. Were you with him on April 22nd, 2018? Yes. Who else were you with? Uh, I was with his brother, Abede, and his girlfriend at the time, Alexis. And where were you guys going? Um, we had went to a lounge and then we decided we want something to eat and we ended up going to the Waffle House. Who was driving? Akila was. And where were you seated? Uh, in the passenger seat. And about what time did you get to the Waffle House? Uh, I don't know the exact time. Three something. In, in the morning? Yes. Um, had you ever been to Waffle House before? No. Did you want to go to the Waffle House? No. It was the only thing that was open at the time. Um, and so, were you going to even go inside the Waffle House? No. I wanted him to order for me, but um, he, ne he ended up telling me to get out the car and go ahead and order because he knew I was picky. Who was he? The key line. Wait, he... He said he knew that you were picky, so come on yeah. inside. Okay. Um, and was that kind of the, an aspect of your relationship? Yeah, he knew me the best. When you went inside, um, what, did, what did you do once you got there? Um, when we went inside, um, he gave me the menu, and uh, we ended up ordering, and I just picked something and he knew exactly what I was going to pick anyway um, and then I went to sit down while we waited for our food to go do you know where you sat at? at? Um, I, we were sitting towards the door like in some chairs that were lined up in front of the door what was the what was it what was everybody kind of doing inside the Waffle House um, there were some people standing and talking. It was kind of really loud in there. 
So it's kind of hard to pay attention to everyone, but just regular things. Some people sitting in the corner and some people up talking. And we were just sitting down waiting for our food. Okay. Um, and as you were sitting to wait for your food, um, did you ever see a gold pickup truck pull into the parking lot? Um, yes, when we first pulled in, um, when I was going to sit in the car instead of going in, I vividly remember looking at the car because um, our car was um, not right next to it, but there's like a handicapped space, but in between the handicapped space, it's those horizontal lines in between. And um, I remember looking at his car because it was so odd. His um, the tint on his windows was very, very dark. So I just kept staring at it because it was just abnormally dark. Um, and as you were sitting inside, did you, I guess, was there some point in time that you heard some loud noises? Yes. Well, can you describe what they sounded like? Um, the first one was a extremely loud pop to the point to where it really hurt my left ear and then hearing became very like um, distant in my left ear. Did you know whether it was a gunshot at the time? Um, the first uh, sound I heard, no I didn't. But the second one I knew because that's when glass started to shatter. And what did you do once the glass began to shatter? Um, in a split second I looked at Akilai and we both just got on the floor and um, ended up crawling on the floor next to him. Did you have a, a verbal agreement that you were gonna, did you tell each other, let's go this particular direction? No, we just looked at each other and just ended up getting on the floor together. And what did you do as you got on the floor? Um, just began crawling. I wasn't really, we weren't really paying attention to our surroundings. We just knew that we had to move. Did you hear any more gunshots as you were on the floor? Yes. They just kept, the gunshots just kept coming. And I was just wondering when they were going to stop. Did they get louder at all? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. It was so drowned out. The noises were so loud that after a certain point of the noises keep happening, they all sounded the same. Um, did you see where the gunshots were coming from? No. Did you ever get injured? Yes. What happened? Um, I don't remember the moment that I was shot. I just remember I went to look at Akila and he was not crawling or moving anymore. So I tried to move forward to get to him to figure out why he wasn't crawling anymore. And when I looked down, I noticed that the that I was shot and the gunshot had um, ripped, ripped my leg away. And I couldn't get to him because my leg was heavy. It was still attached in the back. And what do you mean by that ripped your leg away? Um, it was severed. Like the only thing I had connecting was a little bit of skin on the back. And that prevented, that prevented me from getting to Akilai because it hurt to drag it. You couldn't move your leg? No. And, but you were still trying to get to Akila at the time? Yes. Um, was it, can you describe uh, anything else about your injury as you were there? Um, I then began to notice that it wasn't just, when I knew it had, you know, was decapitated in a sense. I then noticed that like the my bone was missing, like in the middle, like it just wasn't there anymore. Like there was no bone. I couldn't figure out where it had went to. 
And um, I was just trying to keep calm because I knew Akilah was beside me. And if I panicked that, he was going to panic even more. What did you do once you realized that you'd been shot? Did you try to contact anybody? Um, I believe I saw James Shaw. Um, I'm not sure where he came from or what had happened previously. I saw him come by me and um, I had asked for help but at the time because of the situation, um, he said he couldn't help me at the moment. And then after that, that's when the panic set in because I didn't see anyone else. So then I called 911. And what, what was your experience like with 911? Um, it was terrible. Um, when I called, the lady was upset that I didn't know the address. And I was trying to explain to her that it was a new location and I just honestly didn't know the address. And she just kept getting frustrated over the fact that I didn't know the address. So how long did you stay on that call? Um, I'm not sure, not very long. I ended up um, hanging up and calling my mother. And so when you called your mother, what, what happened? What did, how was that conversation? Um, it was a very hard conversation. I called my dad first before I called my mom and my dad didn't answer the phone. Um, I was just thinking to myself, it will, at least if no one's gonna come for me, at least I can say something you know, to my parents before if anything happens to me or if I pass away. And I called my mom and she was a little bit confused at first and I was telling her I was shot and she kept saying, oh, you're taking shots. And I was like, no, I'm not taking shots. And she remember her just making me laugh and I was really happy because at least, you know, if something were happened, the last thing I remember was my mom making me laugh. And uh, I told her where I was at and she finally understood. And that's when she said she was on her way with my dad because um, I only live about five minutes away from the Waffle House. Well, they, they only live five minutes away from the Waffle House. Okay. Well, my parents. You're saying... You, you used to live five minutes away from the Waffle House. Yes, well, I did. It's just that I had an apartment, which was five minutes away, and then my parents' house was also five minutes away. Oh, okay, understood. Understood. Um, and so, is there some point in time that either officers or any paramedics come and give you any assistance? Yes, um, I hear someone come in the door and um, at first I get really nervous and scared because I see the police officers and they're armed as well. So I was a little taken back and frightened. And then um, an officer had came over and he was looking at our injuries, trying to figure out what was going on. And um, I remember he looked at Akilai and um, Akilai just kept saying his arm was hurting but he only said it, I only heard him say it like two times and then after that, I didn't hear anything else from Akilah. Okay. When, the, when the paramedics arrived, did, did they, uh, what did they do to assist you? Um, well, when they first arrived, they looked at Akilah first cause he was right beside me and uh, they put him on the gurney and then the paramedic came to me and um, he let me know um, that he would have to shove my leg back on and that it was gonna be extremely painful. And uh, I remember him telling me, tell, I remember telling him, please don't touch me because it was just so painful. And um, he told me if I need to scream, scream and to wrap my arms around him. And then I just remember feeling the worst pain in my life and just screaming while I, I held my arms around him. And then I just kept asking them about Akila and where he was going and they just kept telling me to, you know, focus on me right now. And so as you were experiencing the worst pain of your life, did you 
did you get to share any final words with Akila? Um, before they right before they carried him away, I just told him I love you. If I don't get to say it again, was he ever was he able to say anything back to you? No. Did you see him again? No. The last moment I saw them was I saw him was when they took him away. Now after the paramedic, as you describe, basically pushes your leg back together, what do they do to you next? Um, they tie a really tight tourniquet around it and I remember I just wanted it off because it was so painful having it tied on. And then they begin uh, lifting me on the gurney. Um, and then I remember being rolled out and I remember looking to my left out the gurney and then that's when um, uh, I saw Joe. You saw Joe Perez? Yes. Where was he? Uh, he was laying down. Do you appear alive to you? No. I asked them. I began asking the ambulance men where they're going to help the man on the ground. And the ambulance men covered my eyes and told me not to look. Okay. <clears throat> Once you got to the in the ambulance, where did you go? Um, they ended up taking me to Vanderbilt. Were they uh, able to give you any medication to assist in your pain? Uh, not really. <laughs> when I got in the ambulance, um, the man just said, it'll make you loopy. And I was like, okay, I'll take it. But I was just loopy and in pain. <laughs> and that didn't help. <laughs> um, and what about the ride to the the rest of the ride to the hospital? Um it was very bumpy uh, and then every bump and turn and anything it just hurt any type of movement in the ambulance and they were telling me they were trying to get me there as fast as they could what do you know what hospital you were taken to uh Vanderbilt Medical Center and what happened when you got there do you do you know um I remember them rushing me out of the ambulance and they're like running with the gurney and all these nurses or doctors are surrounding me and they're ripping my clothes off and turning me over and I asked them not to turn me over because I was in so much pain but they said they had to so I ended up just screaming again while they turned me over and um, I hear the nurses talking and they're like where are we going to put her because um, they had too many trauma patients because Somebody had arrived before me, and I figured it was a key lie. And somebody else also had arrived before I arrived there. So they had no choice but to do who who was in more critical condition first. So I just laid there while they put towels and all this stuff on my leg because they couldn't get me into surgery. And were you able? Were they able to give you anything to actually alleviate the the pain you were experiencing? No. How long did you sit there in pain waiting to be able to get into surgery? Um, oh, like an hour, hour and a half. And I remember my dad getting so mad and frustrated because I was bleeding through everything they put on it. Um, once you got into surgery, um, what do you know what the procedure was that they had to do on, on your leg? Um, I don't know the exact terms. I just know they said that I had six hours to try to get a um, a good working blood vessel to connect my leg back or it would have to be amputated. And then for the first week, I had to um, be monitored to make sure that it didn't um, die off. Did, do you know if they had to bring in any specialists to, to treat you? Um, yes, uh, later on because my injury was too severe and uh, my surgery had failed, one of the surgeries they did have failed, they ended up um, sending in a military doctor.
you said one of the surgeries failed. How many surgeries have you had? Um, 14, 15. You've had almost 14 or 15 different surgeries? Yes. What are, what are they doing? What are, what are they having to do to your leg? Uh, complete reconstruction from skin grafts, bone grafts, um, muscle grafts, um, trying to correct um, uh, the misplacement of my leg because when the bullet hit, it exploded like a bomb. So I had things in places they didn't belong. So they were just doing their best trying to reconstruct it. Were they able to get the bullet or the bullet fragments out of your leg? Um, no, that stays in for the rest of my life. Has that caused you any difficulties? The bullet fragments remaining in your leg? Uh, not per se the bullet fragments. It's just more of like a mental knowing it's still there. Like I know I, I, I wasn't born with my leg like this and I wasn't born with those fragments in me. So it's just another memory that, you know, I have to carry with me. When you've gone through these skin graft, grafts, muscle graft, bone grafts, all of these different surgeries, um, are you able to immediately recover? No, each surgery um, doesn't happen fast. like. If I do have a surgery, um, sometimes recovery just from one surgery is six months. And then if it doesn't go well, then that recovery can be six months to eight months. So it's always prolonged. And then when you have the surgeries, um, you have weight limitations, like um, you can't put any weight on it. So you're always getting setbacks. If you learn how to you know, do something this way, then when you have surgery, now you have to learn a whole nother way to do it all over again, and the cycle just keeps happening. Okay. And I, I'm sorry, I, I want to ask you, you a question back to the first surgery. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the doctor said you had six hours to get a work, a good working blood vessel. Mm -hmm. um, were they telling you that if you didn't, that you might die? Yes, a uh, possibility of bleeding out and also the possibility of amputation. When I first woke up, they let me know that it was my option. If I didn't want to fight for my leg, that I could let it go. And if I chose to fight for it, it was still an option that I could still lose it. Ms. Wagner, when did you learn that Akila was deceased? Um, I didn't learn until like maybe two to three days later. They didn't immediately tell me. Um, I guess uh, the nurses thought it was too distressing. Okay. Did you? Did you see the person who shot you and killed Akila? No. Will you ever be able to walk normally again? No. Thank you. No question. I'm sure we'll do it. I think I'm going to use the cord for it. Hmm? I shouldn't get my mask on. Oh, okay. Take your time. I get the chair for it. All State calls Brennan McMurray.
So if you would raise your right hand this morning, please. You sign this prayer, affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Amen. 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 Good afternoon, Mr. McMurray. Would you please state and spell your name for the record? Brennan McMurray, B-R-E-N-N-A-N-M-C-M-U-R-R-Y. Uh, and Mr. McMurray, are you, I guess, a native of Nashville? Born and raised. Okay. Um, but do you live here currently? No, I live in Chicago. All right. Um, were you living here in April of 2018? Yes, sir, I was. Okay. Um, do you remember the evening of April 22nd, 2018? Can't forget it. And why is that? Uh, I've never seen a mic I wasn't afraid to talk into. Um, it was a um, very traumatic night, not only for myself, uh, for my best friend. And honestly, we probably had it the least. Um, it's a night I'll never forget. I think about it every day. Uh, I will say that for a while, somebody else thought about it every day. As um, far as like, you know, like people seeing you out, saying, hey, I saw you. And that kind of wears on you after a while. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and you said your best friend. Who is your best friend? Uh, James Shaw Jr. You, you were pointing. Is he in the courtroom here today? He is. Okay. Were you with him that night? Yes, sir, I was. What? What brought the two of you together that evening? Uh, we actually had just left a uh, party at a nine bar on Bell Road. Okay. Um, and so what were you going to do after you left the, the party? Uh, our intentional plans were to go to Taco Bell. Um, we always, it's probably like the most favorite restaurant we go to. Uh, I know that sounds really crazy, but we've been doing that since high school. Um, but when we were driving past that on Bell Road, the lights were off. So we figured that they were closed. Uh, we were actually on the phone together at the same time while driving separate cars. Um, so I, I was hungry and I wasn't gonna go home and cook. My wife was asleep, my kids were asleep. So, you know, banging pots and pans just wasn't an option. So I was like, hey, do you wanna go to Waffle House? Um, so the Waffle House that we were going to was the one right there on Bell Road, uh, right off where the Thorntons is. Um, so that's where we went first. Okay. And uh, why didn't you go into the Waffle House at, next to the Thorntons? So we did actually. So when we pulled up, the way that you turn after the Thorntons is like a driveway uh, to the Waffle House. Um, cars were parked all the way aligned there. Um, the parking lot was full. So we ended up parking on like the curb area. Um, when we were walking out of our cars to there, it was like an altercation going on in the actual parking lot. I think a lady's car had gotten hit, screaming, fussing. Um, that was sign number one, like, I don't know. We went into the restaurant. There was only two seats that were available. It was all the way in the back uh, where like the counter kind of like goes and it's like a seated like on the bar. They hadn't cleaned them off yet. And so we were like, all right, we'll take these two seats. Um, so we started to sit down, but it was just a lot of like commotion and ruckus in there. So we both looked at each other and was like, hey, you want to leave? Like it, it just didn't feel right. Um, so we ended up leaving. We never even got a menu or anything like that. Uh, James needed gas, so we got gas. Uh, and I was like, well, why don't we go to the Waffle House on Murfreesboro Road? They just built it. Uh, I never really seen anybody in that parking lot. Cause, I mean, I live in Antioch. Like, the woods from the back of that Waffle House touch what's within my town home. Um, so we went there, uh, pulled up. I parked forward facing, which is kind of weird. I never do that. I always back in, but for some reason, I like pulled straight into the parking spot. Uh, I do distinctly remember James backing in um, in the parking spot beside me. Now I got out the cars, walking into the Waffle House, and I, late at night you're always observing what's going on around you, right? Like you don't really, you know, it's dark, you don't know what's going on. Um, so from there, when we were walking to the door, there was a gentleman sitting in a car. Uh, I think it was a gold Silverado, like a truck. Uh, and he was just staring at us. It was very weird that he was staring at us. Uh, even at that moment, I had turned to James and was like, hey, like this, this is the type of person right here that would like shoot a place up. Not knowing that literally, that was the type of person that would shoot a place up. 
Um, well, no, let me let me pause you there for a second. Um, you said that you saw a gentleman sitting in a truck, and he was staring at you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> did he say anything to you? Nothing. Could you tell how he was dressed? He had it like a, a coat on or a jacket. It was kind of shimmery, but it was, like I said, it was dark. I mean, if you think about the way that that Waffle House, and I've, I tried not, even when I lived here, I tried to drive past it. Um, but it's very light where the door entrance is, but in that second part of the parking lot, it's kind of dark. So you can see it, but like you could see him like staring out the window. Like, I, I think the window was down, actually. Um, okay. But just staring at us, like a piercing stare. It just didn't seem right. Okay. And so as you make the comment to, to Mr. Shaw about um, the person that was sitting in the car, I guess, let me stop. Do you re recall in from that moment independently what, could you identify who that was at the time? Who was sitting in the vehicle? Are you asking me is he in the courtroom right now? Well, I'm asking do you, would you at the time have been able to recognize him? Honestly, probably not. Okay. White man, I could tell you that. Um, not he wasn't like big or anything, like 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 big, like you know, uh -huh. big. Um, but if like you were to ask, like I, I could maybe, but I can't just tell you out the gate one hundred percent. Okay. Um. So once you walk past the truck, what do you do? Go in the Waffle House. We we don't walk past the truck, like literally past it. But the truck's right here. The door's here. Walk into the Waffle House. Uh, go to the bar. Um, we normally sit in a booth, um, but the booths are kind of full. And then there was one that was open, but it was like in between people. And like I said, we just left another Waffle House because it was packed. And so at the counter, it was pretty open. So I sat in the third seat. And then, you know, guys, they don't ever sit beside each other. It's like going into a restaurant, right? And so James sat in the first seat at the end to like leave a seat so he could out and have some leg room. Um, Obviously, phone keys on the table, um, and we start talking, conversing. And I distinctly remember the waiter kept stacking up plates, and he kept stacking them up extremely high to the point like I'm like he's going to drop these. I'm not going to say the word, but he's going to drop these plates. Uh, so me and James were laughing about that, um, and we hadn't even gotten. He was like, "Hey, I'll be with you guys in a second." Um, and then I don't I don't think that second even really happened again. So. Um, Did <clears throat> and what do, you, what do you mean that you don't think that second really happened? What, what happened? So distinctively, I remember loud commotion, boom, turn back to the left. You look, there's smoke, but it was glittery smoke, like almost like, like somebody had shot like confetti almost in the air, but it was thin. Um, and then everyone was running. It was a complete chaos. So I look to my left, see the smoke. I look back to my right. James has jumped out of his seat immediately and take off. So what do I do? I jump out of my seat and take off. Um, and then we're going back towards the restrooms. Um, James slips, grab like the back of like his pants, roll into the back area. There was another gentleman back there. He had like braids of dreads, uh, come find out Mike. Um, and we were trying to beat down the back door to get into the, what we thought then was the kitchen. So we're beating on the door. I'm like yanking on the door, kicking the door. And then the shots get louder and louder. And you can kind of tell they're getting closer and closer. So at that point, I was like, everyone get into the restrooms. People got into the back restrooms. At this point, I don't know where James, I thought James had gotten to the other bathroom. And then there was another one in the front. Me, Ishan, and Alexis get into that bathroom. Obviously didn't know them at the time. Um, then locked the door. They were sitting doors here. They were against this wall. Ashan made Alexis get in the corner so she could tuck down. I sat on the other side of the wall. Me and Ashan were looking at each other face to face. Um, and the shots just kept raining at that point. So it's just getting louder and louder. Like it was like rumbling, like getting closer. Okay. Um, when you, when you got into the back area. Yeah. And you said you're beating on the door. Um, was there any other exit back there for you to, to go no, out of? That, that was that was the only exit that I thought was there. I mean, the other, you know, the bathrooms, like 
like I said, we frequent Waffle Houses. Well, not no more, but we used to frequent Waffle Houses all the time. So there's a door that swings both ways, and there's always a men's and a women's restroom. The only other door that was available looked like a door that opened up to something, which you would think would probably be like the back area of the kitchen. Um, so that was the only door that I saw. I don't think there was no door. It's a wall back there if you walk straight. And who was back there with you in that space as you were trying to beat on the door and, and get through? Uh, Mike. Not sh Mike Garth, maybe? His okay. last name? Um, but like I said, he had braids, dreads. Um, and me and him were like actively trying to get this door open. Um, while you were inside the bathroom with... Uh, is is Aishan, uh related to Aquila Da Silva? Yes. Okay. While you were in the bathroom with him... And the the other young lady, Alexis, what what happened? What was going on? So me and Ashan had talked briefly that if he shoots the lock, and we have to rush the door. And that's the only way. Like he, there's no way he's coming straight in here. Um. And so, at that point too, like we were calling nine one one, but it was like a like a busy tone almost. Like it was like everyone was trying to call nine one one. Um, and then uh, the, the automatic toilet flushes. And so at that point, you're like, damn, like, he's going to know we're in the bathroom. Um, and then it stops. Um, and so at that point, Ashan is like, listen, my brother's out there. I got to go out. I'm like, yo, wait. Either he's reloading or something's happening. Like, there are too many shots going on. Like, we got to wait. Um... And so it stops. Probably after like 10 seconds, open the door. We both peek out. It's a magazine right there with a... Because that door opens up to the actual door that leads you into the restroom area. Um, and so the glass is shot out on that door. So we're peeking through that. Uh, at that point, you can see Tia there. There's another lady on the ground, which we now find out is the Ebony, uh, laying face down. Um, and then the staff is behind there and then a car pulls in the parking lot. So you can see straight through that glass all the way to the other door, like other window on the other side of the Waffle House. Uh, car pulls in. I say, get back in the bathroom. We lock the door again. Why did you, why did you feel the need to go back in the bathroom? Because I didn't know what was going on out there. Okay. I mean, literally there's bullet shots through that glass, loud, like a lot of rounds you could hear. You don't know. And like, I, like I've talked about before, it's, you don't think anybody's coming for you. Like, I have no reason for them to come at me. So I'm just trying to get out the way. But also, I don't know what's going on out there. So I see somebody else pull back in the parking lot. I'm thinking, well, they, nobody's finished. Because why would somebody pull into the parking lot if all of this just happened? So we get back in. Uh, and then after a few seconds, I start hearing BJ, BJ, BJ. I open the door because it's James's voice. Uh, and then I peered through the glass again because I wasn't just walking straight out. Uh, and he's standing there, like kind of like limping. Uh, and then I'm like, "Hey, are you okay?" Uh, and he's like, "Listen, you, you talking? We gotta go." Uh, so then we walk out of the Waffle House, and then that's where I see Joe laying on the ground. Um, uh, and then at that point, I'm like, "I gotta get my keys." My keys were still on the table. So I'm like, how am I going to drive my vehicle? At that point, I wasn't even thinking about James's truck. I'm thinking about my, my truck. So I go back in to get the keys. T is there. And she's like, please help me. I'm like, okay. We go back outside. Uh, and then that's when all like the first responders and everything start to show up. Okay. Um, you paused when you mentioned Joe. Did you know him before? Not at all. Okay. Um... And when you saw the Ebony, did she appear to be alive to you? No. Were you able to see um, Ishan's brother, Akila? No. After, once you met with um, James Shaw, as you come outside, what could you describe what his demeanor was? He was in a rush, I'll tell you that. Um, I mean, thinking back on it, like, there's nothing but adrenaline had to be going through his body. 
he was still kind of in like proactive mode, like trying to like, even like when the responders came, like he was telling them where to go when they got into the Waffle House, what to do. Like there was somebody, he was like, there's somebody still alive in there. I go help them. Like I even like there, like we put him on a seat outside. Uh, I was sitting on the curb. Yeah, he, he was still kind of in go mode. Did you ever see the person that was shooting the weapon? No. I never saw anybody at that moment with a gun in their hand. Did uh did Mr. Shaw, did James, did he have any injuries? Yes, his hand was uh extremely burnt. Um and then he had a cut on his well what I thought was a cut, but a wound on his elbow. And then like some other like glass and stuff like that around like around his hands and stuff. One moment, Your Honor, please. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Judge, our next witness is D'Angelo Groves. state your name and spell your last name for the, for the court reporter. Uh, my name is D'Angelo Groves. That's D-I apostrophe capital A-N-G-E-L-O. Last name is Groves, G-R-O-V-E-S. Okay. Do you live in Nashville, sir? Not anymore. Okay. Did you grow up here? Say it again. Did you grow up here? Uh, around this area. Okay, great. Uh, do you have a sister? I do. And tell me her name. D'Ebony Lachey Groves. Okay, I'm going to pass you a photograph and ask you if you can identify that. Yes. What is that a picture? Of? This is a picture of the evening. Okay, Judge, if we could make that exhibit number 15, introduce that into evidence and publish it to the jury. Mr. Groves, how old was your sister in April of 2018? Uh, 21. And was she in school? She was. Where was she in school? She was a student at Belmont University. How far away from graduation was she? Uh, probably like one semester away. All right, and you were also attending Belmont at the time, is that correct? Correct. And when did you graduate? So um, the weekend of the events um, was, the next week was finals, and then I graduated May 5th, like a couple weeks later. All right. So because y'all were both in school, were you in school at Belmont as well? Right. And because y'all were not only brother and sister, but both students at Belmont at the same time, did y'all see each other frequently? We did. Okay. When was the last time you communicated with your sister? So the last time I communicated with her would have been on that Saturday, the 21st. Uh, it was on Instagram. And tell me what that communication was. So she had posted a video and she had a song playing in the background and I commented and made some little witty brother joke. Those are not always super witty, but <laughs> right. Um, but did y'all exchange a few comments back and forth at that point? Uh, I don't know if she 
actually said anything back at that particular point because I was I was out of town, so I was like on and off my phone. So right. I just had saw that she posted something, and I made a comment on it, and and that was that. All right. So that was on April twenty first of two thousand eighteen, and then this happened on the early morning hours of April 22nd, just Correct. a few hours after that last interaction. Is that right? Correct. How did you find out that she died? Um, it was actually one of her um, sorority sisters. I had like a series of people who kept calling me because they were trying to find out what happened to her because I didn't even know she was, she was, that she was even out. And um, I kept getting people calling me and I didn't recognize the numbers, so I didn't answer the phone. And then one of her sorority sisters left me a voicemail. So I called her back and they were like, do you have any, um, we've been trying to contact her. And she was with um, a young lady who was shot, who I later found out was Sharita, um, cause I didn't know her at the time, but nobody knew where she was. And so I kept calling her phone and she didn't answer. I. Um, she was supposed to show up for work that morning and never did. So then like her boss and some employees, they were all looking for her. So I was like spending the majority of my trip home from Atlanta, like trying to call people and trying to figure out where she was and how to get somebody to, you know, get in contact with just anybody who could like give me something. I think I called like three different hospitals and nobody could tell me anything. Mm -hmm. And at some point later on, on the day of the 22nd, you found out the horrible news. Correct. Right. And I actually, one of her friends uh, reached out to me on Facebook and said that they saw it online that she, I guess, had passed away. And that's literally how I found out. Okay. And uh, your parents are here today. Yes. Is that right? And, uh, but you were selected to be the representative of the family to talk about your sister. Is that right? Yes. That's all. No question, John. Thank you. The state's next witness is Sharita Henderson. Ms. Henderson, could you please state your full name for the record? Sharita Henderson, S-H-A-R-I-T-A-H-E-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. And Ms. Henderson, how old are you? I'm 28 years old. And so back in April of 2018, how old were you then? 24 years old. And what were you doing at that time? Were you in school or had you already graduated? I had already graduated and I was working at Cumulus Media. And where did you graduate from? Middle Tennessee State University. And were you the member of any groups or organizations while you were at MTSU? Yes, I was a part of Alpha Kappa Psi Professional Business Fraternity and then Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And how long had you known Deebony Groves? Since uh, 2016. And can you describe your relationship with Ms. Groves? She was um, my best friend, one of my best friends, and like my little sister. Uh, we knew each other through Delta and had mutual friends and found out later we had a lot more mutual friends than we even realized. Um, but we did pretty much everything together. If I wasn't with my best friend Jasmine, I was with Diebney. And so Diebney was a couple years younger than you, is that right? Yes. How often did you guys hang out together? seemed like every other weekend since the moment we met. And that particular weekend of April 22nd, 2018, what was going on that weekend? 
Um, we had sorority events that were going on. Tennessee State University was about to initiate a new class of girls into our sorority, and I had one that I've been a mentor to um, that was on that line, and her mom was actually one of my math teachers um, when I was in high school, and I knew her from since she was a baby, and uh, she selected me to be her special or like her big sister who um, helped mentor her through the process. And so I was going there to pin her um, as she was being inducted to our sorority. So it was a big honor. Which if people not familiar with that, that's a very big honor, is that yes. right? So is it fair to say that that was a pretty special weekend for you guys? Yes, it was. And what events did y'all have that night? Where were you guys at? Uh, we had gone to, uh, earlier in the day, we had gone to the Delta Pinning um, for the new girls. And so I pinned um, Kia Armstrong, who was my mentee at the time. And then um, the Omegas, which are our brother fraternity, um, Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, they were having their new member presentation um, right after the Delta Pinning. So Debony and I went to that after. And then they also had a social event afterwards um, at the Tennessee State Fairgrounds. And we went to that party. And where did you go after you left the party? Uh, we stopped at the first Waffle House that um, is further up the road on Murfreesboro Road, right where you get to um, the split where the interstate is. Um, and then we decided that that parking lot was too full and we looked inside and it was too full. There weren't any seats available. Um, so we said, why don't we just go to the one that's closer to my condo um, since we were gonna, she was gonna spend the night with me anyway. She had already spent Friday night and I think Thursday night too. Um, so we were gonna go to the one that was closer to my house because we were really hungry and we had been at events all day. So uh, we decided to go to the Waffle House where the incident occurred. Had you ever been to that Waffle House before? Once or twice um, during the daytime. Um, I think I always had somebody with me. Uh, I usually do. And can you describe going to the Waffle House? Um, we pulled into the parking lot. I was driving um, and we didn't see anything wrong. It looked less full than the one where we previously gone. Um, so we went inside and we stopped at the first booth, and I remember Debney saying like she needed to use the restroom. Um, so I went with her because in our sorority, like the cardinal rule is you never leave somebody alone. Um, so you always go with your sister to the bathroom if she leaves the room, wherever. Um, so I went with her because um, I have a phobia about public restrooms. I don't like using them. Um, so I just waited for her outside, and then we both came back into that first booth and sat down. And Your Honor, at this time, I would ask to publish what's been previously introduced as Exhibit 3, and specifically the video labeled number 2. Right. Ms. Henderson, have you reviewed this video previously? Yes, this morning. And are you able to identify yourself and your friend, Ebony Groves? Yes. So I'm going to ask that the video play, and if you can just narrate and describe what you see and what you recognize. Sure. So that's me driving um, into the Waffle House parking lot, and I par um, parked in the first spot right there because the next, um, I think there was one spot that was empty, and then the next one was a handicapped spot. Um, and so that's D. Ebony opening the passenger side door. And then a few moments later, I opened the driver's side door. So I closed the door and um, went into the back seat to get my wallet and um, jacket. And so that's D. Ebony and I'm walking um, towards the front entrance. And just for the record, are you wearing a red baseball cap? Yes, um, I think it had something Delta related on it. Um, what are the Delta colors? Uh, red and white. 
So that's why we were both kind of dressed very similar. We tended to do that a lot. And that's where we kind of paused to figure out what we were going to do and where we were going to sit. And then we're walking towards the bathroom. What was the mood when you guys got there? Um, I think we were like laughing and joking and talking like we always do. Uh, and then we sat down. It seemed pretty calm. There didn't seem to be any problem. And I think we um, picked up the menus, but I kind of ordered the all-star special whenever I do go to a Waffle House, which isn't that often, but um, I pretty much at any restaurant stick to the same thing. Um, and so we're laughing and joking and I think because the workers were kind of busy, uh, we picked up our own menus because we pretty much were like, we're comfortable. Do you remember anything else that you guys were doing as y'all were sitting there? Um, we started singing Jesus Loves Me. Um, we're both preacher's kids. Um, so our, our, her mom and then my dad um, are ministers and so God is always around us and um, we're always singing and joking and laughing about church and we were both in choir um, growing up and so we're like singing to each other pretty much. And at this point does anything seem off to you? Anything at all? Um, not at the time but I think a couple minutes um, a couple seconds later um, James Shaw and Brennan McMurray um, walk in and I recognize Brennan because we went to uh, middle and high school together at Martin Luther King. And had you seen Brennan lately? Um, not at that time. I hadn't seen him since high school. So at first I don't think I recognized him but then I kind of looked around like wait a minute I know that guy. And so that's Brennan uh, McMurray and James Shaw entering the Waffle House and um, sitting behind me. Did you notice anything at all out in the parking lot? I mean, was that even your focus? It wasn't at the time. Um, but shortly after James and Brennan entered the Waffle House, um, we started hearing the loud popping sounds. Um, I think a lot of people in the restaurant thought they were fireworks, um, which was kind of odd for that time of year. Um, but I recognized that they were gunshots and they were pretty rapid. Um, and so in a couple of seconds, you'll see me duck down with the ebony. And when you heard the gunshots, you said you ducked down. Can you describe kind of how you ducked down? Yes, um, I panic kind of set in because um, I was trying to look for an exit and I realized that we didn't have a lot of time. Um, and once the glass shattered in the window of the Waffle House, um, I slouched uh, in between the seat because I couldn't get out fast enough um, to run towards the back area. Um, so I told D. Ebony to get down under the booth and then um, I placed my body on top of her hoping that um, she wouldn't be seen because I'm her big sister and it's my job to protect her. Um, and so that's what I did was try to cover as much as, of my body as possible. Um, on top of her to protect her because, you know, I feel like her mom and dad knew she'd be with me or they didn't know me at the time, but they expect like her friends to take care of her and return her home in one piece. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to do that um, despite my best efforts. So once you've ducked down and are under the table, lying there trying to cover D. De what's what are you hearing 
or what what do you remember in that moment i kept hearing the gunshots um and i remembered that torian had gone outside for a smoke break um and did you know torian at the time i did not at the time but you had noticed him walk out yes because uh, I remember him letting his other co-workers know that he was about to take a smoke break. Um, and I think Debbie and I kind of made a joke like, they need more workers because <laughs> we hadn't even placed our order yet. Um, but I, I knew that he was outside. Um, I didn't see Joe at first. Um, but as I looked out the window, once the glass shattered, um, he had turned to me. I could tell, obviously, that he had been hit at least once. I didn't know how many times at the time, but he turned to me and mouth, play dead. Um, and so that's what I did. And um, then I saw him be shot in the head, um, and he died right after that. And are you hearing gunshots go off? Yes. Can you describe how you and Debbie are positioned under that table? Um, she's kind of folded really awkwardly under the table because we were in a rush and we knew like there's nowhere to run. The best thing we can do is try to not be seen or make ourselves seen. Uh, and so I figured I'm bigger than her, so I would jump on top of her. Um, so my body, my lower torso, was covering most of her body. Um, and then I think her legs were like towards um, my back. Um, and I had slouched down and one of the pictures you showed earlier was of the booth that we were in. And that's my blood um, from my arm when I was shot. And I had my head there at first. What do you remember kind of the events immediately before you were shot, and then if you can describe those moments in which you were shot. Um, right after Joe Perez was shot and then Torian was shot, I remember Torian like running, um, but I, I didn't see him at first. It was like a flash. Um, and then Travis Ranking entered the Waffle House and um, I just tried to be as still as possible because I, I felt like if I breathed, um, he would know that I was still alive. Um, and I wanted to be as still as possible and pretend like I was dead. And I figured if he thought I had already been shot, he wouldn't shoot me. Um, but as soon as he came in the door, he looked me in my eyes and he shot me immediately. Um, he shot me three times. He shot me um, in my right forearm um, so I have a concave injury um, this is the entrance and then on the front of my forearm is the exit wound um, that's right here it's about this long um, and then I was shot in my upper bicep and it took a chunk of my arm off um, and the bullet fragments ended up in the soft tissue right outside of my lungs um, and then he also shot me in my leg and my leg was detached. Um, it was hanging on by like tendons and skin. Um, and I remember looking at it and cause I didn't see my arm at first. And I just remember looking at my leg like, God, please help me because I, I don't think I'm gonna make it. Um, and I looked at my leg and I passed out. Uh, so I think I was in such shock um, that I passed out for a couple of seconds. And Do you remember feeling pain at that moment? Immediately. Can you describe that pain? It was the worst pain I've ever felt. It was excruciating. Um, it was probably worse than some of the surgeries that I've had, but those were extreme as well. At any point, were you able to look at your leg? Yes. Um, Can you describe what your injury looked like? Um, the bullet had gone through the left side of my calf and entered, and it exited through the right side of my calf, and it was completely severed. Um, both bones that are in my 
lower calf, um, my tibula and fibula, they were shattered. Um, and I remember I had army boots on because that's what um, we wear with Delta. We spray paint our boots red, um, but they're army boots we get from a surplus store. Um, and I just remember it being turned. Like if my foot's like pointed straight at you, it was turned on its side and the leg was almost completely detached. Were you able to move it? No, um, I tried, um, but I felt like I couldn't move my right arm. Um, and that's when I looked at my arm and realized how much damage had been done and that I'd been hit in the side. Um, but I tried to move it with my left and I couldn't move it at all. You said that in that moment that you kind of blacked out. Yes. Was that a permanent blackout where you no. stayed unconscious or at some point did you regain consciousness? I regained consciousness, um, I assume a couple of seconds later, um, but I definitely blacked out and things stopped breathing. And what do you remember kind of in those moments about how you were feeling, what you were seeing, what you're hearing? Um, I had what I call like a heaven experience, you know, when someone says like, don't go towards the white light, um, I did. Uh, and I just remember thinking like, God, please give me a second chance. Um, I, I don't wanna die right now. Um, and that's why when I came to, um, I took a big breath and then I kind of looked at myself like in my back where we are, um, back in the Waffle House. And I looked around and I remember, um, I guess James Shaw had walked past us and out of the restaurant. Um, and I tried to ask him for help. And I think he kind of looked at me like he didn't realize that I was alive. Um, and that's when I started saying like, I'm not dead. Um, and I asked him for help and I think he was in shock and so he was like, I can't help you and he walked out the door. Um, and then a couple of moments later, the first police officer um, that arrived on scene came in and that's when I took another big gasp because at that point panic had set in and I was trying to breathe and couldn't really catch my breath. Um, so I took a big breath and gasp and said, I'm not dead because I knew the next person that came in that door was going to think I was. Um, and he looked at me and was in complete shock. And then he went towards... And you're uh, talking about that police officer. Yes, the police officer had gone towards the left, uh, towards where Tia and Akila were and checked on them. And I kept thinking, like, come back, come back. Um, because I didn't know when the next person was going to come to come help us. And he did come back and he asked some of the patrons to keep me breathing. Uh, so they got on top of the booth where we were sitting. And I guess they had heard us singing. Um, and so in, instead of like counting, um, they asked me to say Jesus. Because um, I guess they knew our faith and they were like, if you can say that, you know, it'll keep you alive. Um, and it did. What about Diabony? Did you ever see her? I did not see her. I um, did not see her face. Um, I like to think, fortunately for me, my last memories of her were her alive and smiling and laughing with me. Um, I like to think that her last moments weren't of the terror that we experienced. Could you hear anyone else in the Waffle House? Um, I could hear some of the patrons and customers trying to call 911. And I remember them being like frustrated with the operators um, because no one knew the address and everybody kept yelling like, what's the address? What's the address? But because it was a new one, nobody knew. Um, and so I, I think people just hung up and they were like, we have to basically do this on our own until um, someone comes to help us. Um, and then a couple moments later, 
the first set of paramedics started to come in and assess the situation and they kind of split up in teams and they came towards me and then the other team went towards um, Akila and, and Shanti. When Mr. Ryan King came inside the Waffle House, you've described that he looked right at you yes. before he shot you. Yes. Was he saying anything? He didn't say anything, but he looked at me in my eyes and he was determined. Like he knew what he was doing and what he planned to do. Um, and I'm sure my eyes looked like I was begging for mercy without saying anything. Uh, and he shot me anyway. Do you see that person in the courtroom? Yes, I do. Could you point him out? And then... He's right there. Can you and describe he's what he's AB wearing? Blue shirt. Your Honor, if the record could reflect that this witness has identified the defendant, Travis Ryan King. Ms. Henderson, you described that the first responders finally were there and they had a gurney. Were you taken to the hospital? Yes. Um, it took a while for them to unpin me from underneath the booth. Um, and so I think one of them had crawled to the second booth to grab part of my leg so that it would stay as close to attached as possible because it was just hanging on. Um, and I just kept screaming. Um, and then they finally were able to get the board underneath me and um, they were asking about a tourniquet like did I need one or not um, and they ended up placing like two tourniquets on me and then getting me onto the gurney and I remember it being so difficult it was like five or six of them and it was so difficult to get me through those front doors because um, I'm pretty tall um, I'm 5'9", and my legs were like hanging off of the gurney, and they were just trying to hold it together and hold my arm on. Um, and it took them a couple of tries to try to get through the two doors to the entrance and over Joe Perez. And then they put me into the ambulance, and by that time I was more conscious than I was before, and I remember just trying to tell them everything about me, um, name, address, parents' name, phone numbers, um, whatever I could until I felt like I was going to black out again. I remember getting really sleepy. Um, and they just kept talking to me and like, tell me whatever you want to tell me um, until we can get you to the hospital. And they were trying to find uh, a vein that they could use in order to give me an IV. Um, because I had not had pain medicine, and by this time we're riding towards um, 440. Uh, Can you describe that pain? It was complete distress. Um, it was excruciating. I could literally like feel my heart pumping and trying to get blood to the rest of my body, um, and it just kept oozing and pouring. The blood? Yes. Did, did they give you any pain medicine before during that trip before you got to the hospital? No, I felt every bump, every dent in the road, everything. Um, and I just kept thinking, like, please give me pain medicine. Please give me pain medicine. And they couldn't get a vein because my arm, the veins in my arm were completely shattered. Um, and so was my leg, and they just couldn't get one, and they were debating on whether they were going to put one in my neck. Um, but they thought going down the interstate as fast as we were going was too much. Um, and so they couldn't get one. And I didn't get pain medicine until I was in the OR. How long did it take you to get into the OR, do you remember? Probably about 20 minutes, if, if not longer than that. Uh, when I first got to Vanderbilt, I came through the ER entrance. And um, one of the nurses that was there, actually, I begged her to let me make a call. Uh, I wanted to call my, my parents and tell them where I was. Uh, and so she actually went against the rules and pulled out her personal cell phone um, 
and asked me what the number was and I gave her my mom's number because I figured she would answer. Um, she usually does, especially if it's in the morning. Um, my dad's kind of a hard sleeper and <laughs> he doesn't answer for anybody unless it's me. Um, and my mom answered and she was kind of like, what's going on? And I just said, I love you. And I said, tell daddy I love him too. And by that time, they were like, okay, we have to go. Um, and so I think the nurse was, she took the phone from me and she just said, like, you need to get to Vanderbilt as soon as possible. Um, there's been an accident. Um, and until the news broke, my parents didn't know um, that I had been shot. They thought it was a car accident and they thought, there she is, <laughs> texting and driving. We told her, don't do that. And I don't typically do it, but. Um, you know, they were like, man, she's been in a car accident. We got to get there. And they're thinking, you know, I'm fine and that it's not life or death. They thought I was okay, but I wasn't. What's the next memory that you have? Um, I remember waking up the, I guess it was the next day. I'd had like an 18-hour surgery, my first surgery. Um, and I think I asked where D'Ebony was. And like nobody would answer me about where she was and every time I like tried to ask um, they would like give me more pain medicine and pretty much put me back to sleep um, so I didn't find out until a couple of days later because um, I had to have another 18 hour surgery um, both of those were the life-saving surgeries to try to um, replace the veins in my arm and leg um, and can you explain what you mean about life-saving surgeries um, where they come in and they bring a team of doctors, trauma surgeons, um, plastics. Um, they had a vein doctor that I think was one of the only ones of his kind in like four states. Um, and I think he had heard it over the trauma radio and left his home and came in because he knew it was going to be needed um, based on the injuries that they had described on the radio. Um, and he came in and took a vein graft from my right inner thigh and they used it to replace um, two arteries in my arm and then one of the arteries in my leg. How many surgeries have you had since this happened? Approximately 24. And can you describe what were you able to do or what were you not able to do after this happened? In the beginning, um, I wasn't able to do anything. I needed assistance with moving. I couldn't even walk yet. Um, I couldn't sit up on my own. Um, they had to help feed me, um, bathe me, clothe me. I couldn't use the restroom on my own. Um, I think that was the most difficult because as a young woman, you know, 24 years old, the last thing I want is somebody to have to help me use the restroom. Um, and having my parents have to learn how to do all my wound care. Um, doctors and nurses constantly coming in. Um, I had to learn how to feed myself. I was right-handed, so I couldn't use my right arm at all. Um, so I had to teach myself how to do everything with my left hand, um, hold a spoon, hold a fork, um, open things, write my name. That probably took the longest. Um, I was an artist prior to this, so I like to paint and draw and I did a lot of like paddles and artwork for people that were in sororities and fraternities. Um, that's probably where I made the most money because um, I knew the most people that were in uh, our Divine Nine organizations of the National Panhellenic Council and so they would always come to me like, hey, can you paint me a paddle with my name and our chapter and all that stuff on it and um, that was my joy was to do that and play tennis and I couldn't do those things anymore. I want to kind of go back to those first few days that you're in the hospital. 
Are you watching the news and on social media, or are you kind of isolated from what's going on with all of the media attention? Completely isolated. Um, My parents did not want me watching the news. Um, I didn't have my cell phone. I think it was in police evidence. Um, And then they eventually brought it back to me. Um, I got it much later, Um, but I was completely isolated. I didn't turn the TV on. I think my parents probably moved it to the other side of the room, so I wouldn't even be able to get to it. Um, At some point, did the detectives come to you and talk to you about what happened, about the shooting? Yes, they did. And did they come back and see you and bring you a set of photographs? Yes, they did. And were you able to identify the person who shot you in those photographs? Yes, I was. If I can have just one moment. Your Honor, at this time, I would ask the court's permission to allow Ms. Henderson to actually show her injuries in her arm and her leg to the jury so that she can display the injuries that she's just described. Do that. Would you do that? Yes, I guess, Ms. Henderson, if you could just point out to them that entrance, room, entrance wound in your right forearm and then also the other side of the exit wound. And then if you can show them also that entrance wound in your right bicep area, that part of your arm that's missing. And then if you can show them the wounds to your left leg, both sides of it. And is that the entrance wound on your outer left leg? Thank you, Ms. Henderson. I don't have any other questions, but the defense attorneys might. Ms. Henderson, you don't have to get back up here. We'll get you whatever you have up here. Thank you.